here. I the floating meeting control. Okay, so um, we're going to continue uh, sort of where we left off. Uh, so last week we were talking about inductive reasoning, uh, induction, uh, and inferences. Uh, and I suggested that that was one of three or several different kinds of ways to use information uh, to solve problems, to make predictions. Uh, and so we're sort of talking about a more active uh, kind of thinking process. Today, I want to talk about uh, two other kinds of ways to do it. Uh, we'll talk briefly about causal reasoning. Uh, so some of this material, some of it appears uh, in the textbook, but a little bit of this material, the first part, does not appear in the textbook. Uh, one of the things I want to highlight, though, uh, is uh, some ways in which you can think about cause and effect uh, beyond just looking at correlations. So we hinted at that uh, idea last week, uh, that correlations and causation are linked together. Uh, you know, we're aware that causation can't be inferred solely uh, from correlation, but that those two think correlation and cause are correlated, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Some of this stuff isn't in the textbook, particularly I think the section on the Delta rule uh, isn't uh, directly in the textbook, but you should probably know it because I'll definitely ask questions about that uh, on the midterm. Uh, then we'll get into uh, deductive uh, reasoning for the rest of the first half, take a break uh, and talk about deduction. So reasoning and logic. Uh, this expands on some of the definition that I gave uh, uh, last week and that I give in the textbook. Uh, reasoning can be best defined as going beyond the information that you have in front of you uh, in order to comprehend uh, a situation and to think about it, uh, to solve problems, to make predictions, uh, and to maybe reduce uncertainty. We talked a little bit about that last week when we said people want to be able to use the past to predict the future. Um, and so reasoning of all of these kinds of uh, in all of these different ways, uh, has to do with going beyond what is immediately present. Whether that's making inferences or deductions, uh, taking knowledge about what's known and making conclusions, uh, you're discovering something new by thinking about it. Uh, so last week, we mostly focused on induction or inductive reasoning. Uh, what I want to talk about today is causal reasoning, reasoning about cause and effect. Uh, and then deductive reasoning, uh, which is a formal kind of logic, uh, which is a lot more difficult and requires a lot more system too, which is one of the reasons why it's prone to uh, heuristics uh, and biases and fallacies and errors. So as we discussed last week, uh, we all know that you can't, at least inconclusively, infer causation uh, from correlations. We also discussed that, of course, there are well linked, right? The idea uh, that the higher the correlation, the more certainly we can predict from one member what the value of the associated member associated member will be. Uh, this is the transition transition of correlation into causation. So we know that these two things are linked, and in fact, uh, whether it's humans or non-human animals, we tend to look for correlated attributes. We tend to look for things that go together uh, in temporal. Uh, you know, temporal congru congruity or spatial congruity. We look for things that go together and we try to use that information to know what's going to happen next. So whether it's my cat looking for the correlation between uh, the sound of me going downstairs and starting to prepare dinner, which means that it's time for her dinner, uh, or uh, any other kind of combination. So we look for those correlations to try to infer cause and effect. Maybe we don't necessarily need to know what causes those things, right? Uh, the cat is wrong <laughs> often about what causes the link. She just knows that one thing predicts the other uh, and that her behavior is guided by one action, knowing that some other action might occur afterwards. Uh, the sounds that she makes, the meowing that she makes when she wants to be fed, doesn't necessarily cause me uh, to feed her, right? Uh, but those two things are connected. Uh, there's a link there. Uh, and all the cat wants to do is know, how do I get my food? When do I know, you know when is the food going to appear in the dish? When are the pellets going to appear in my food dish? That's all she's interested in. Uh, and all I'm interested in is getting on the rest of the day so that she can 
uh, stop pestering me. Uh, so there are some correlations there. There's definitely some cause and effect, but it isn't a strict causal link. It isn't that all of those things are causing uh, the food bowl to fill up. Think about a basic light switch. So when I come in, uh, one of the things I want to make sure I can do is, you know, turn off the lights uh, that, which, oh, no, actually, that's the opposite direction. Those are already turned off. So I never remember which one it is, right? I'm always sort of pushing uh, one or the other, but one of them turns it off. And so I can uh, have the lights turned off uh, where I want them to be off. So there's a correlation, and it's a really strong correlation. Uh, the correlation between the light uh, is going to be greater than zero, right? Most of the time when I turn the light switch on, the light goes on as well, right? And that's probably true for most uh, light switches. The question is, does the switch itself cause the light to come on? Uh, what would be your first impression to, an answer to a question like that? Is the switch causing the light to come on? We know it's not causing the light to come on, right? The switch is an, is an enabling condition. Uh, it enables something, uh, which is, so this is just the first uh, graphic that I gave from buildmyowncabin.com. Uh, I guess this shows a really simple way to wire uh, a light switch. So there's a circuit completion that happens and all the light switch is doing is interrupting that circuit when it's off and allowing the circuit to continue. So it doesn't really cause the light to come on. Uh, it enables the light to come on. Uh, it's 100% correlated. Uh, almost 100% correlated, uh, but not always, right? Sometimes you can turn the switch on and the light doesn't go on. Uh, does that mean there's no longer a, a causal relationship? Uh, well, there are probably other things that are happening, right? The light might turn itself off because the light bulb uh, doesn't work anymore or because the power doesn't work anymore. Uh, or maybe the light comes on by itself uh, because of faulty wiring. Uh, in other words, the circuit completes uh, even though the switch uh, wasn't used. So all of these things are possible, even though the correlation that most of us notice is pretty close to 100%, right? You just expect it to happen. Uh, so there is a strong relationship between correlated attributes uh, and cause effect. And as we discussed last week, uh, it's a subset of all of the things that are correlated. Some of them are causally related. Uh, most causal relationships have a correlational structure as well. So how do we tease these two things apart uh, a little bit more usefully? Let's talk about models of causality, because most of us really want to know what causes something. Uh, whether, you're, uh, whether you want to know what causes you to do well on an exam uh, or what causes uh, different kinds of you know, different kinds of social interactions, what causes somebody to behave in a certain way. A lot of us want to figure out causal structure. Uh, so two of the things that we use, and again, this is going to end up being a lot about correlation, uh, are Q contingency and temporal congruity. These two things uh, can tell us a lot about causal structure. Qs, something that you observe, uh, predict something because they are associated with outcomes. Uh, in other words, there's a Q contingency. Uh, when one thing happens, another thing happens, possibly because it's caused. The other thing that matters for us is that they're close in time. Sure, lots of things can be correlated, uh, but only things that seem to have this Q contingency relationship and a temporal relationship are likely to be causal relations. Because we can see that there's a cause and effect link or what appears to be a cause and effect link. In other words, a contingency. When one thing happens, the next thing happens. Uh, and also that they're closely related in time. When one thing happens, the other thing happens quickly afterwards. So it's easy to see causal relationships uh, in things that happen right after each other. It's harder to see causal relationships uh, in things that take a longer amount of time. If you've ever tried to engage, uh, let's say it's, what are we now in early March, right? Uh, so we're well into the, uh, into the year. Uh, but at the beginning of the year, it's really common to make like New Year's mm -hmm. resolution, right? Uh, and a lot of people make a New Year's resolution that might involve some kind of behavior change. Maybe you want to uh, 
exercise more, be more active, or maybe you want to uh, reduce the amount of time that you spend on your device or a screen, or maybe you want to uh, eat in a healthier way. So a lot of people do that, right? You make a New Year's resolution to improve yourself uh, somehow. Um, you can do that. You can change your behavior to make some improvements, but it never happens overnight, right? Uh, if you wanted to uh, change your eating behavior so that you can, uh, you know, maybe stop eating. You stop eating ice cream at night. I like to, you know, uh, it's, it's ice cream's delicious, right? So you, suppose you have a habit, like I do, uh, of wanting to eat ice cream uh, sometime around seven or eight o'clock after dinner. Uh, but suppose I say, well, you know, every time I eat ice cream, I feel like I've eaten too much ice cream, right? So maybe I want to reduce that. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Right? It's going to take a long time to change those behaviors. And so sometimes we miss the cause and effect. Uh, between an intention to change a behavior and the actual outcome. Uh, if you're trying to improve uh, physical fitness, maybe you want to exercise more, you want to walk more, uh, you could start doing that, but it's going to take a long time to see any benefits, if there are any at all. Right? It might take weeks or months uh, to be able to notice those kinds of changes. Uh, if you wanted to change your, um, maybe you want to use less, uh, spend less time on your smartphone. Uh, we could all do that, but it's, it's really easy to change the habit for one day, harder to change it over a long period of time, and then to notice that maybe those changes that you wanted to engage in have a positive or a transformative effect uh, on your overall well-being, right? That's going to take weeks, months, and you're not going to, you're going to maybe miss some of this temporal con congruity. So we might miss uh, the cause and effect relationship. So let's look at this relationship a little bit closer, especially the idea of temporal congruity. What I have here is a contingency uh, table. Um, and in this contingency table, there are four possible uh, cells. Uh, each one of them has to do with whether or not a potential cause is present. So something in the environment causes something else. And let's say we want to look at some of those potential causes. We will call these candidate causes. So we're just going to label them as C. So candidate cause C can either be present in the environment or absent in the environment. So whatever it is we're looking at, it's either there or it's not. Some of the time it's there, some of the time it's not there. And then we also want to look at effect E. Uh, so whatever we're looking at a relationship between a cause and effect, uh, sometimes the cause is there, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes the effect is there, sometimes it isn't. So you can see the cells that probably are more important for us. Uh, and that are time, those are times when the cause that we're trying to determine, potential cause, is present and the effect is present. That suggests a strong linkage. That's uh, Q contingency. Cause is present, effect is present. And this also, by the way, uh, cell D here effect, uh, deals with uh, Q contingency. When the potential cause is not observed, and the potential effect or behavior is not observed. You expect that to have a lot of observations. That's a strong Q contingency. You don't want to see lots of cases where the cause is present and the effect doesn't happen. So this is flicking the light switch, the light comes on, not flicking the light switch, we're flicking it off, and the light goes off. And these are times uh, when you turn the switch on and the light uh, doesn't turn on or you don't turn the light switch on and the light comes on by itself uh, for whatever reason. You want those to be small numbers and you want A and D to be large numbers. If that's the case, then you have good reason to suspect that there's a causal relationship between some, something you observe uh, and something else you observe. So let's look at one that we talked about last week. We suggested in retrospective designs, looking backwards, uh, sometimes we miss causal relationships because we get rid of the temporal congruity. And we suggested one of the most controversial uh, relationships that was explored, especially in the last 20 years, uh, was the potential relationship between common childhood vaccines for measles, mumps, and rubella, uh, which reduce measles, mumps, and rubella, almost eliminate. Um, but for a while, it was suspected uh, because of some uh, correlational research or some uh, retrospective research, that the same vaccines might also have a causal relationship on autism spectrum disorder. Uh, 
most people don't agree with that uh, because the evidence isn't there. Uh, but for a time, there was a suspicion because of some uh, evidence that was presented that there might be a relationship. Uh, so let's take a look at that potential uh, relationship um, using this contingency. I should say, by the way, this simplifies the relationship uh, between vaccines and autism and lots of other things. So this is a very simplified epidemiological model. There are lots of other things uh, that would be put into a more complicated model. But I want to use this as an example to show uh, how you can understand or determine uh, some causality. So these are the four different conditions we would be interested in when we simplify this into a two by two contingency table. Uh, if we wanted to understand whether or not people getting measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines when they're kids uh, it could potentially cause uh, autism spectrum disorder, we would want to look at these four possible scenarios. Cases where people were vaccinated and also uh, fall into the category of autism spectrum. Uh, people where cases, cases where people are vaccinated but do not have autism. So this is when the vaccine is present. Some people have autism, some people do not have autism, right? So uh, there's one, uh, one possible relationship. And the other cases are people who were not vaccinated. Not everyone uh, is vaccinated uh, with those childhood vaccines, uh, sometimes because they can't, uh, and other times because uh, parents uh, disagreed with it. Uh, so there are uh, lots of cases uh, where people do not receive those vaccines, some of which might also uh, be, uh, have autism spectrum, uh, others uh, not autism spectrum. So those are the four uh, groups that we want to look at. If there's a causal relationship, we'd expect this number to be relatively large and this number uh, to be relatively larger. In other words, uh, there should be a lot of people vaccinated who have autism. And for people who are not vaccinated, not much autism, right? So this is where we can get into this idea of a delta rule. This delta rule is a, is a formula that lets us determine the strength of causal relationship. It's related to the idea of a correlation, uh, but it takes into account all four contingencies. Um, now, I won't ask you on an exam to uh, recall this from memory, uh, nor will I ask you to work out a... Um, a specific problem using this formula. So just like we discussed um, for the uh, uh, some of those uh, similarity models, when I suggested there were some formulas that uh, can describe the geometric model uh, or the contrast model. I want you to understand what these formulas do, but I won't be asking you to work out any problems with them. However, I do have questions on the midterm related to this uh, delta rule. So the delta rule gives you the change in causal strength. And it gives us the ability to determine whether or not uh, there's a potential causal link be between some candidate cause and some observed effect or behavior. Um, and essentially what you're looking at is the probability of the effect, in this case, we're gonna assume this is autism, um, when the Q is present, so that's this number here, uh, and it can be given by taking the value of this cell here and dividing it by uh, the value of all of the cases where the Q is present. So if we want to know the probability of the effect when the Q is present, uh, we take the A value and we divide it by A plus B, which is all of the cases where the Q is present, uh, when the effect is there and when the effect is not there. Does that seem straightforward so far? So that's a straightforward probability. Um, uh, definition. We remove from that the probability of the effect when the Q is not present. So we have two things. Uh, we want to look at the cases where effect and Q are together, and we want to take away from that cases when the effect is not associated uh, with the possible Q. And what's left over uh, is the possible causal relationship uh, between the two things. That seems straightforward so far. Let's work through an example, uh, and then I'll come back and make sure it seems clear to everyone. So if delta P is positive, then the Q is believed to produce the effect, but there's a relationship. Uh, so if that's a positive number, there's a possible causal relationship. Um, if it's negative, then it could be a preventative or an anti-causal relationship. 
Um, and if it's near zero, then there's probably no relationship. So you can interpret this in the same way that you would interpret a correlation coefficient. Uh, when it's a strong positive number, there's likely to be a strong causal link. If it's a strong negative number, there's likely to be a preventative link. Uh, and if there's no number, there's not likely to be any relationship between those two things. So let's fill this in. Let's suppose um, we want to look at all of these cases. So all of the times when people are vaccinated, some of some cases will have autism and some cases will not. And all of the candidate cases where people do not receive the vaccine, again, some with the effect present, some with the effect not present. So just for practical purposes, um, this is information from the United States from about five years ago. These um, are pre-COVID uh, numbers here. Um, and what we're looking at are the number uh, of people uh, who in the United States uh, about five years ago um, would be uh, defined as having autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so that's a range of different uh, types. Um, and this would be all of those types together. So out of uh, 320 some million people uh, in the United States, uh, about 3.5 million would fall into this uh, category. And as you can see, given the um, rate of vaccinations, uh, which is 92%. So 92% of those 320 some million people in the United States receive their vaccine. So most Americans are vaccinated by default, just like most Canadians are uh, for these measles, mumps, and rubella. It's just part of your childhood vaccine. You can't attend school uh, in most cases without those vaccines, right? It's something that you get when you're uh, a very young child. Not everyone does, and there are lots of reasons not to, but most people uh, the vast majority of American children uh, get these vaccines early. Uh, which means that most people uh, who were in the category or in this column here of the 3.5 million Americans uh, with autism also received those vaccines, right? So that's that number that looks like a strong relationship, uh, which means that if you are, if you have autism, you likely received your vaccines. So looking at an individual case of someone with autism, they are almost certainly likely to have been vaccinated as well. So at an individual relationship, you can certainly see how that might be a link, right? The individual gets, uh, you know, the infant gets uh, vaccinated uh, later on as a toddler. So you get your childhood vaccines later on. Um, it's clear that uh, you're one of the 3.5 million people uh, with autism. So there could be on an individual basis what looks like a strong relationship between those two things. The difference comes though uh, in the effect absent column where you can see of the 320 million people uh, in the United States who do not have, who are not uh, in the category of autism spectrum, uh, most have also been vaccinated. Uh, 294 million Americans would have been vaccinated without uh, being autistic. Uh, and a smaller number, though it is pretty large here, uh, 25.6 uh, million people uh, who um, did not get vaccinated, but also do not have autism. So the sheer number of people who are vaccinated uh, is going to undermine this possible causal relationship. I keep going, this thing is slower than it should be. Um, so suppose we take uh, again, this uh, probability of the effect when the Q is present. Uh, we take A, which is 3.2, uh, and we divide it by 3 million by 3 million plus 294 million, and you get a very small number. Uh, so this very small relationship. In other words, of the possible uh, relationship, most people are being vaccinated, most don't have autism. So it's a very small number, and you take away from that another very small number. Right? And what you're left with is something very close to zero. Uh, because most people receive those vaccines, the relationship between autisms and vaccines is very low, uh, approaching zero. If anything, there would be a small, um, though likely non-significant negative relationship uh, suggesting that uh, it's definitely not a causal link, right? It might not be a preventative link, but it's definitely not a causal link. The complexity comes when you're looking at individual cases versus population cases. 
Right? And so for individuals on the, uh, in, this, uh, in this cell, uh, it would look like, or it would appear to be, uh, or you might have personal evidence for uh, that strong relationship. So does this seem clear, this idea of a delta rule? Uh, we're taking into account all of these probabilities. Um, and when there are lots of cases of the effect being absent when the Q is present, as there is here, it likely suggests that there's no relationship uh, between the possible uh, cause uh, and the likely effect. We're going to come back to this idea in two weeks when we talk about decision making, because I'll come back to probability uh, and overall base rates. But most of us, um, even if we're relatively well informed, have difficulty making decisions about things uh, when we don't know the base rate. Uh, and in most cases, we don't have access to the base rate. Uh, unless you were to look up epidemiological or population level statistics, you probably wouldn't know how many people are vaccinated with measles, mumps, and rubella. And you probably wouldn't know how many people uh, in the general population uh, would have autism spectrum. Or you probably wouldn't know a lot of these things because that base rate information isn't directly observable. Yes? But would you make like a general conclusion? Yeah, you could definitely make a general conclusion in this case. So you could generally conclude from this case that there's no relationship uh, between those two things. And that would be irrespective of uh, individual personal evidence that you might have observed uh, through family, friends, or yourself of being in one or more, you know, one of those cells or people in your family uh, being in one or more of these cells. That, that's certainly possible. But when you look at the larger relationship, uh, this suggests that there's no causal relationship. Does that seem clear? It finds the causal relationship between the two, but and then you can make a conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, and of course it doesn't, just like correlation, it doesn't necessarily specify the mechanism. Uh, when you do find evidence for cause, uh, it doesn't necessarily spe specify the way in which the Q causes the effect. What it suggests that there's a relationship there that you might be able to understand more fully. We'll come back to this, by the way, in the second half, when we talk about conditional logic, which is if-then logic, which lines up with our understanding of causality, uh, but not always. Causality is very difficult. Most of us have uh, reasons, whether it's correlations or delta rule or observations, uh, to start thinking about what causes something else. But until you investigate or understand the real links, the mechanisms, uh, it can be really difficult to understand uh, causality, which is why there's lots of different approaches uh, to epidemiological uh, questions. So whether it's uh, you know medical questions or uh, sociological questions or political questions, cause and effect is very difficult uh, for most of us to understand. We can make some assumptions and we can make some uh, conclusions about it, uh, but understanding the true nature of causality is really difficult. Doesn't stop us from trying though, right? I mean, that's part of what uh, humans wanna do is to figure out how to reduce uncertainty and to know what causes something else. We wanna know what's coming next. And this is one way to be able to do that a little bit more carefully. Does that seem good so far? All right, so let's now switch over to the idea of uh, deductive logic. We're gonna come back to causality in the second half when we talk about conditional reasoning though. Uh, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit at the beginning here too as well. Uh, so with deduction, uh, deduction has a, a fairly, fairly strict definition. Lots of kinds of uh, logical thinking. There's lots of kinds of reasoning. Deduction is a type of reasoning that allows you to uh, determine the validity of the conclusion. So in a logical deduction, if it's a valid deduction, the conclusion is the only possible one you can draw. How many of you have ever played that annoying game, Clue? Uh, that's a great example of logical deduction, right? Um, how many of you played Clue recently? Not a lot of hands going up there, but suppose you've played Clue. You know how the game is played, right? Uh, you've got to wander around on this little board, uh, go into rooms, and then you have to accuse people, right? It was, the, it was Mr. Plum with the pipe uh, in the conservatory or something like that, right? Uh, and then if people have uh, evidence that 
uh, disproves or disconfirmatory. You check it off on your little detective notes until you can make a conclusion at the end, right? The only possible conclusion. If you've done it right, uh, and if you've collected evidence, uh, you've eliminated all of the possibilities. Because if you've ever played this game, of course, if you know that if you make a, a final declaration of who did it and you're wrong, you're out of the game, you lose, right? Uh, so you're not allowed to continue anymore in that game. Uh, so you only make the conclusion uh, if you're able to uh, do it uh, perfectly. That's a great example of deduction. Uh, you eliminating possibilities so that once you've made the conclusion, it's the only possible one. That's how deduction works. Uh, suppose you buy your coffee from McDonald's. I use this example. I think I used it in um, my 2135 class as well, because McDonald's coffee is known to be a little bit hotter than Starbucks and Tim Hortons uh, and some of the other coffees that you might buy. Uh, for a long time, it was really hot, which is why there was a uh, you know, a well-known lawsuit of someone receiving third-degree burns when they spilled uh, McDonald's coffee uh, on themselves uh, accidentally. Uh, so the coffee was known to be almost at boiling temperatures. Uh, it makes it last a little bit longer. Uh, it's also dangerous. So you buy a coffee, you take a sip, and you discover that it's very hot. Uh, you can now make an inductive generalization. Remember we said induction is uh, doing observations right? It's sort of a bottom-up kind of reasoning. So you've gone to enough McDonald's now, and you've seen enough evidence from the McDonald's to know that you can form a generalization, maybe a statement or a belief uh, or an understanding about McDonald's coffee that it's hot as a form of inductive reasoning. You can then use that generalization to form a premise. In other words, a statement about the world uh, that is known to be true. McDonald's coffee is very hot. So if that is a true premise, you can now make deductions uh, from that true premise, which means you can predict with certainty an outcome. So if the premise is known to be true, and if you structure a logical task in the right way, you can have a lot of confidence uh, that the conclusion uh, is also valid and it's the only possible conclusion. So. A premise can be used to make precise conclusions, which we're going to call deductions. Combined with additional premises, we can create what's known as a syllogism or a categorical syllogism. Syllogism is a statement about categories uh, and attempting to reason about a specific case. So if McDonald's coffee is hot and you have a coffee that is from McDonald's, you can conclude without a shadow of a doubt that it is also very hot. Set aside the fact that, you know, if it cools, <laughs> if you've been sitting, if it sits there for an hour, it's not going to be very hot. We're not going into uh, those kinds of cases. We're talking about a specific case. You go to McDonald's, you already know McDonald's coffee is hot. You get the coffee from McDonald's. You don't need to take a sip to know that it's hot because you can deduce that it's going to be hot based on your knowledge. And that's what I mean by discovering something by thinking about it. That seems really trivial uh, and it seems pretty straightforward. Um, but with most deductive tasks, you can structure the task in a way where you can think about things in a way uh, that gives you a lot of confidence about what to expect. In this case, it's more than just an inference or a probabilistic belief. Uh, it's a precise deduction about this particular coffee. And not only is it a precise prediction about this particular coffee, uh, you understand why this particular coffee is going to be hot, because it relates to premise about all McDonald's coffee. And it relates to a second premise about this particular coffee belonging to that particular category. So if everything in the category of McDonald's coffee is hot, uh, and this coffee is a member of that category, then it has to be hot. Right? So this is a foregone conclusion. We know it belongs to these groups, and so we expect it to be uh, the case. So it's a more complicated way of thinking about things. Most of us uh, wouldn't do it that way, right? We would just assume that it's going to be hot sort of probabilistically based on evidence. But you could also create this syllogism uh, and prove to yourself <laughs> uh, that it is going to be a hot uh, cup of coffee. We can do a lot of things with this idea. Um, so the structure of a logical task, let's go through this uh, idea of a structure of a logical task. This is important because unlike induction, uh, where we're sort of dealing with observations and making generalizations. 
a logical problem or a logical deduction has to be structured in a particular way in order to allow us to arrive at a valid conclusion. If it's structured in the wrong way, uh, then we arrive at a non-valid conclusion. This is important for legal reasoning. It's important for scientific reasons. Uh, and it's important for everyday reasons. But it also takes a lot of cognitive effort uh, to structure them. As we'll see in just a few slides, as soon as any of these examples are embedded within discourse or a paragraph or a conversation, it can be a lot more difficult to see where the premise and the conclusion is. These are really straightforward because we've taken out all of the additional information. We're just using premise and conclusion. So your friend is waiting by the Starbucks or by the shoe store. So you're going to the mall uh, and your friend tells you, I'm gonna be waiting either by the Starbucks uh, or by a particular shoe store. Uh, let's say the, um, I don't know, it's one of the shoe stores in Mason. I don't buy shoes very often. Foot Locker, let's say by the Foot Locker, two shoe, the shoe store, the Foot Locker uh, or the Starbucks in Mason Bill. Um, you get there and your friend's not there, so you conclude they can only be at one other place, right? They've clearly told you uh, this to believe this premise. I am going to be at one of two places, nowhere in between, I'm not going to any other stores. I will wait for you at the Starbucks or at Foot Locker. So if you arrive at one place and your friend isn't there, uh, you absolutely know to expect them at the other place. Right? There's no reason to think that they would be anywhere else. So. Um, Let's call this an argument. An argument is a deductive statement that has several components, premises and conclusions. Um, facts in the premise are things that can be true or false, descriptions, statements, and predicates. So in these premises, the facts can be stated as true or false. The friend is waiting at the Starbucks or the shoe store. That's something that can have evidence that's either true or false. So your friend is either there or not. They can't be both places and they can't be neither unless the premise says something about them being in both places or neither. But as it's stated, this premise gives you uh, two pieces of information and only one of them can be true. You're also gonna see a lot of operators and these are ways to combine ideas or combine concepts or combine facts. So common operators might be things like and uh, or or. So in this case, your friend is waiting by the Starbucks or by the shoe store or tells you, you see the word or or anything that's uh, or related, that only one of them can be true. If you want to say that it's possible for both of them to be true, then you would use and or and or, which means that both possibilities are true, right? But if it's or, only one thing can be true. Not tells you something about the trueness or the falseness uh, of one of these components. Your friend is not at Starbucks. Now, this all seems really straightforward. Um, all we're doing is providing evidence that one of these is true, but there's an important distinction here. Once you know that one of them is not true, then the other one has to be true. We'll get into that in just a little bit when I show a short video towards the end of this, um, towards the end of this lecture. Uh, but it's also really important for some of the questions on the final exam, uh, because I do have one question on the final exam that asks you to work through a series of statements just like this, that someone is either in, in this or in this. And sometimes it can be really complicated because if you prove that something is, you know, if you have evidence that tells you that one component of an or statement is true, then the other one has to be false. And sometimes the one that is false is a negative, which means that the other one is true, as we'll see in the, in the example towards the end of this lecture. Uh, deduction can really, is really difficult, but it can be really powerful uh, if you're able to uh, give it your full cognitive resources. Uh, the conclusion is usually marked off with some kind of an expression like therefore or so, you know, so there. Uh, so we want to be able to determine, uh, given this information, that this is the conclusion that we want to make. And this is true whether you're playing Clue or whether you're trying to find your friend uh, in the mall. So at Masonville Mall, we go in. I always go in during the, in the Marshall's Home Sense uh, entrance, mostly because I don't know. When I do, 
there's usually just more parking available here. So I always go in this way. Now I've got to meet somebody either at Starbucks uh, or by Foot Locker, which appears to be somewhere over here. Uh, so where am I going to go first? I'm going to go to the Starbucks first. That's going to be my first piece of information, right? If they're not there, then I can wind my way through them all uh, over to the Foot Locker. Uh, so it can be really useful to do these kinds of deductions. This is a pretty straightforward problem. Obviously, you wouldn't solve this by logic. You would solve this by uh, messaging your friend as soon as you got to the mall, say, okay, where are you now, right? So you wouldn't bother uh, with the logical problems. But the point is you can bother with the logical problems, right? We have lots of ways to solve problems, inference uh, and predictions and categories. Deduction is one of those ways. So yes, you would probably solve the problem by, before you even get into the mall, asking your friends exactly where are you right now. But suppose you don't have your phone. Uh, you might uh, need to be able to do this uh, kind of logic. And all of us can uh, engage in logic and deduction if we have to. So it can be counterintuitive. Uh, this is an example I discuss in the textbook. So this comes from uh, an example in 1962. Uh, Mary Henley was a philosopher at uh, Yale University um, and was looking at the ability of people to reason logically. And one of the things she noticed is that even students who have had some courses in basic deductive logic, uh, as soon as you're presented with a more complicated problem, it becomes really difficult to separate the logic part of the problem with everything else, all of the context and all of the semantics. And what she found is that most people, even when they're told to reason logically, and even when they understand how to reason logically, avoid reasoning logically uh, and tend to use as much additional context as possible. So we just take into account everything uh, that we possibly can to make predictions. And sometimes that can lead you to make incorrect uh, deductions. So here's an example. Now this is from 1962. It does sort of sound more than a little bit dated uh, in terms of the description, but um, so she asked her participants uh, to look at brief stories like this and to, to determine whether or not the conclusion is valid or not valid. In other words, when she says, does it follow? Uh, what she means is using logical deduction, is this a valid conclusion? So here's one of the examples. A group of women were discussing their household problem. This is what I mean about it being uh, kind of dated from 1962. So Mrs. Shivers broke the ice by saying, I'm so glad we're talking about these problems. It's so important to talk about things that are in our minds. We spend much of our time in the kitchen that of course, household problems are in our minds. So it is important to talk about them. So you can kind of see some of the premise and conclusion stuff there, right? You can see some premises. She's stating some facts. And you can see a conclusion. It's important to talk about them. And the question she asked her participants is, using deductive logic, is this a valid conclusion? In other words, is this the only possible conclusion that follows uh, from these statements? And she found a variety of things. So uh, some people would say the wrong answer. So by the way, this is a valid deduction. Some people would say, no, it's not a valid deduction. Uh, it's not important to talk about things that are in our minds unless they worry us, which is not the case. And you can see where you might get that, right? There's nothing in uh, Mrs. Shiver's description about household problems being worries. She just says they're in your mind. Uh, so. This is an incorrect answer to the extent that it's incorrect for two reasons. One, uh, it's incorrect because it's a valid deduction. And I'll show you why in just a minute. Uh, but it's also incorrect because they're inserting stuff in here that's not mentioned. One of the things about logical deduction is that you don't want to insert your own beliefs uh, or other things. Because otherwise you're putting information into the syllogism that wasn't there in the first place. You want to determine whether or not your friend is waiting in the Starbucks or the shoe store. And those are the only two pieces of information. You can't start thinking about other stuff like 
Well, maybe they went to another shoe store or maybe they're on their way from the shoe store to the Starbucks, or maybe I got here early. That may all be true, but that's not helping you reason logically, right? So you want to avoid making any of those additional assumptions. All we have are the facts in front of us and do they support the conclusion? They actually do support the conclusion, but she also found that a lot of people would arrive at the, you know, arrive at the right answer. Yes, it's supported by the facts, but they would also give a lot of extra information that wasn't presented uh, in the premises. Yes, it could be important for the individual doing the talking and possibly for some of those listening because it's important for people to get a load off their chest, but not for any other reason unless the process, unless in the process one or the other learns something new and of value. That all sounds great, but none of that was mentioned uh, by Mrs. Shivers. Let's go back to the original. Um, so going back to the original, you can see that Mrs. Shivers only mentions a few things. It's important. We spend time in the kitchen. These things are in our minds. So it's important to talk about. So you can distill this down to a few simple statements. Cause and effect, by the way, I've never mastered the cause and effect between exactly where I need to hold this controller and whether or not it's going to work. I guess I have to stand right here. Okay, so she calls this the failure to accept the logical task. In other words, even when people are presented with something that's fairly straightforward and they're told, use logical deduction, take a course in logic. Uh, you know how logic works. You know how deductive reasoning works. I'm gonna give you a premise and some premises in the context of a discussion Tell me whether or not there's a logical conclusion here. They don't do it. Uh, so she calls this a failure to accept. She's given them a task and they don't accept it. You could really conclude uh, fairly straightforward. It's important to talk about the things that are on our mind. That's one premise uh, that Mrs. Shiver said, right? There's a lot of other information there, but the premise that she's arguing from is this is a true thing. It is important. That's a basic fact. It's always important. It's important to talk about things that are on our mind. This thing is on our mind. Therefore, it's important to talk about the things that are on our mind, household problems. So in other words, uh, another way to define this is it is important to do A, whatever A is. In this case, it's important to talk about things that are in your mind. Um, if we get rid of a lot of the semantics, of meaning and the context, it's even easier to see how this is a logically valid task. It's important to do thing B is equal to A. In other words, B is an example of A. B and A are the same thing in this case. So therefore, it's important to do B. To get rid of all of the meaning, it's a lot easier to see how this is a valid deduction. Problem is, getting rid of the meaning is something that humans are not designed to do, right? We don't get rid of the meaning. At any given time, we want to use as much information as possible to help us get through the world. So asking people to ignore all of the semantics and ignore the meaning is really good. So most of us don't see a question like this. I'm so glad we're talking about these problems. It's important to talk about things. And we don't usually break it down to something like this. But if you can break it down to something like that, and if you can analyze an argument uh, in a way that removes some of the extraneous semantics, uh, you can do a really good job of figuring out whether or not the conclusion is justified. So deduction can be cognitively demanding. I've got two or three more slides and then we'll take a quick break. Um, I wanna watch this short video. The reason I like this video and I talk about this in the textbook uh, is it gives a really good example of a classic uh, logic problem, uh, the knights and knaves problem, which by the way, when I mentioned, uh, that I do have a deductive problem on the final exam. It's similar, not identical on the surface, but it's similar in structure uh, to this knights and knaves problem. And you'll see how difficult these can get um, when additional information is added. So let's go ahead and stop this right now. So just to provide a little bit of context, I'm gonna go make this big. By the way, if you're joining on, um, on Zoom, if Probably it might not work. You can also just walk, watch the link. So let me make this big here, full screen. Uh, so some basic context. Uh, this is from a movie from the 1980s uh, called Labyrinth. I don't know if you've seen this movie. 
it, how does it stream? Does anybody know besides YouTube? At any given time, I don't know what streams on any different service. Uh, you probably notice that every service has at least one thing that you like uh, and a lot of things you don't like so that you're forced to get three or four different streaming services to watch the shows that everybody talks about. So one show on Crave that you like, one show on Disney Plus that you like, and the next thing you know, you're spending way more money on streaming services than you want to. That's an aside. This probably streams on something. Uh, has anybody seen the movie Labyrinth? Um, I mean, this was popular when I was a kid. It was 1985 or something like that. So this is an old, old movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, doesn't matter. Let me just set up the context here and I'll turn off the lights just to make it a little bit easier to see here. No idea which light switch is gonna do what, but we'll find out. That's not the one I wanted. That's actually the one I wanted. Um, so in the context, uh, Sarah, who is the, uh, the young girl here, has a baby brother she doesn't like. Uh, because she's like 15 or something in the movie. She's a, an adolescent in the movie. And suddenly, uh, for whatever reason, her parents have uh, an infant. I don't know if it was, uh, they just decided to have a kid younger that's not explored in the movie. Um, the only thing that matters in this movie is that at some point she wishes that she didn't have an infant brother. And then for reasons unknown to me, uh, that wish somehow stirs an alternate universe Goblin King, inexplicably played by David Bowie, um, who then steals the child for his, to be his own heir. Uh, and her job is now, she feels remorse. She has to go back and get the baby brother back from David Bowie for some reason. Um, but in doing so, she has to go through a complicated labyrinth, uh, which is a maze with lots of tricks in it. So in this particular scene, she's winding her way through this maze. And she comes to two doors that she can't figure out which one is going to be the right door. Uh, one of them is going to lead her to her baby brother. The other one is going to lead to, as she describes it, certain death or certain doom or something like that. So let's go. But her job is to figure out which door to take. Nobody's helping her out. Nobody's saying like, well, this is the door to take. Um, so let's look at this and try to figure out um, how she deduces this. Because so, she's a very specific kind of deductive logic. Someone is making my remarks. Yeah. <laughs> The only way out of here is to try one of these doors. All right, so starting off, there's a, that sounds like a pretty good premise, right? Uh, the only way to get out is to take one of these doors. That's a fact. One of them leads to the castle, and one of them leads to certain death. So you got some basic facts right there. Ooh. Which one is which? So there's another important piece of information. One of them always tells the truth and one of them always lies. Um, so she has to figure out which door is which, and they won't tell her the answer necessarily, but one of them always tells the truth. She can ask them questions. One of them always tells the truth, and one of them always lies. <laughs> Would he tell me that this world is So she asks one question of the red guard. And she points to the blue and says, would he tell me that this door leads to the castle? That seems straightforward so far? Okay, so one tells the truth, one always lies. She asks one question. 
would he tell me that this door leads to the castle? Yes. And the other door leads to the castle, and this door leads to certain death. Oh. Does everybody get that? Of course not, because it happens too quickly. Right? Let's go through that again. But then he wouldn't be. So he would come in. So he would come in. So he would come Whoa. we don't need the commercial so obviously she doesn't it isn't certain death i mean she falls through a hole but it would be a really it wouldn't be a really appropriate children's movie um how many follow that logic did anybody follow the logic i've been using this example in class uh, for a while now, and I still get confused on every sense. So let me break it down uh, slide by slide, and then we'll take a quick break. The reason I like this example, by the way, is it's a great example of a classic problem, but it also shows how complicated it would be if there's a lot of stuff going on. So she goes through it really quickly. We played it twice. She even explained her reasoning, and most people, most of us, including me, uh, can't follow it because she explains it so quickly. So not only does she solve the problem, but even when she tries to explain the problem, I don't follow it, none of the guards follow it, and none of us can follow it. So let's go back uh, quickly here. Um, for the meeting controls, where were you? 7.1, uh, let's make this big again. Where's mine? Going to be one of these cases where it doesn't. Oh, we literally have two more minutes left before break. We just want this to work. Let's go back and try this again. I mean, it was there a second ago, was it not? As far as I can tell, I'm logged in. Let's close these again. I'm going to try this one more time. And if not, we'll take a quick break and I'll try to troubleshoot this so that we can go through it. There we go. Let's go to the very end here. If would say that the This is all I wanted to do. Uh, was to show how this logic works. The reason this logic is important um, is that it shows, the reason this example is important, it shows how difficult it is to reason logically when things go through quickly. In Henley's example, it was fairly straightforward, right? There was just one premise. There was a second premise that provided evidence. And then there was a conclusion. But here we've got multiple things going on and a lot of or statements going on. Uh, and she's attempting to solve this with one piece of evidence. So Sarah solves the riddle. She says to the guard of the red door, would he tell me that this door leads to the castle? In other words, the evidence she's seeking is she asks red, would blue tell me that red leads to the castle? 
Red says yes. From this, she is able to determine or deduce that blue is the right door and red is the wrong door. So she solves the riddle, but in explaining it, it's really hard to see where the logic comes in. Here's the logic. Her reasoning is as follows. If red is telling the truth, because we start with the first premise that one always tells the truth, one always lies. We don't know which one is which, and she doesn't need to know which one is which. If red is telling the truth, that's the question, then blue is a liar. That's what she says. If blue would say red leads to the castle, it would be a lie. Therefore, red does not lead to the castle, which means blue leads to the castle and red leads to the a certain depth. Does that seem straightforward, right? So she says, would he tell me this? So if red is telling the truth, that he would tell me this door leads to the castle, then blue is a liar. And which means that blue would say that red leads to the castle, but it would be a lie. And therefore red does not lead to the castle. So that's one possibility. She combines that with the second possibility. If, would he tell me that this door leads to the castle? The answer is yes. And if red is telling the lie, then blue is telling the truth. In other words, then blue, it is a lie that blue would say red leads to the castle. So red is giving her false information. Uh, therefore blue would say blue leads to the castle, which means that blue leads to the castle and red leads to certain death. Does it seem any more clear or does it still seem slightly confusing? I think it still seems slightly confusing. Um, what she's doing is uh, she's taking one premise, would uh, one tells truth, one always lies. Uh, she asks one question and she comes up with two scenarios. Both of them lead to the same conclusion. If red is the liar, then blue has to be the truth teller. And then you interpret everything through that lens. If red is the truth teller, then blue has to be the liar. And you can interpret the question through that lens. And once you've done that, you realize that both of them lead to the same conclusion. It's very difficult to deal with these or statements. And it's very difficult to deal with statements where one thing is true and the other thing uh, is not true. So what I wanna talk about after the break is to provide some kind of structure. What both of these examples I think make clear from Henley's example, and also this is called by the way, the Knights and Knaves problem. It's a much older problem uh, than just the 1985 uh, movie with David Bowie. Um, the Knights and Knaves problem and the Henley problem both get at this idea that we have difficulty doing deductive logic. It can be a real challenge because it takes a lot of cognitive effort. One of the ways in which we can do it a little bit better is to provide some kind of structure. And sometimes the structure means getting rid of some of the meaning or getting rid of some of the uh, semantics or getting rid of some of your, or ignoring some of your prior beliefs so that you can evaluate just the evidence that's presented to you. If you're doing legal reasoning, for example, you can only take into account what's been presented, right? If you're in a courtroom setting, you only take into account the evidence that's been allowed. Uh, you don't take into account other evidence. Uh, there might be lots of other evidence, but if it hasn't been allowed in the case, you can't use it uh, in your reasoning. Uh, and so it can be really important to understand how this uh, logic works. So let's take a quick break, about 10 minutes. We'll come back and we'll talk about categorical reasoning and conditional reasoning. Thank you. 